government problem has been solved with government band-aid, which has been solved by government band-aid. So if you pull off government band-aid, you have three more broken band-aids underneath it that sometimes make things worse. Mm -hmm. The EPA was not meant to go out and, and harass Oregonians and, and murder or Oregonians. Hey, where's the love for one another? Government doesn't love us. That's what we need. We need to get back to a system where people can take care of one another. What you're inferring is, you know what? If we legalize heroin tomorrow, everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was legal? I bet nobody would put the hand, oh yeah, I need the government to take care of me. I don't want to use heroin, so I need these laws. It's been a long while since I've made a Logan for Liberty episode. And that's okay. A huge problem I have is that I have a million ideas floating around in my head. However, I lack the discipline and attention span to integrate it together in one significant project. Other times, I don't have ideas. Sometimes I have ideas, but they're not original ideas in the marketplace or in the realm of YouTube. These ideas are certainly original to me. Furthermore, between a full-time job and school, as well as personal hobbies and autodidactic edification, my time is allocated to other things. And then there's the time that I waste doing nothing at all. It's unfortunate. Something has changed in my brain, however, as of recent. I have ideas, beliefs, and interests that should allow me to do something interesting on this channel. I have a drive to make something right now. So look forward to more Logan for Liberty and look out for more movie Libertas. I feel a, how would I say this, a new impulse to create because I'm finding a severe lack of interpretations on current events that I feel are obvious. I also feel like in the specific cases where I do agree with an interpretation on a particular current event, I find myself feeling unsatisfied with the, the milk toast defense of these interpretations. In other circumstances, the philosophy acting as the pillars for these milk toast defenses are, in my opinion, just as detrimental as the opposition I deem to be a threat to whatever principle or idea I have. I've witnessed a bit of condescension against those who publicly declare that these protests are, well, essentially Marxist. Just visit any thread or listen to any discussion about this issue, and that's pretty much what you'll see. Of course, there will be those who are unintelligent or uneducated who will throw around Marxist in the same manner that Nazi is thrown around. Historically, as an example um, of this being done, Obama has been called a Marxist and so has Hillary Clinton. The two previously mentioned certainly do have what I would consider to be socialistic beliefs that would certainly fall in line with a Marxist ideology. The ilk of Obama and Hillary, along with their supporters, certainly enable Fabian socialists. With that being said, these unintelligent or uneducated people who've adopted Marxist as a trendy pejorative tend to be the epitome of the straw man that a lot of leftists like to construct basically giving a validation to this straw man. So if you are trying to have an honest dialogue about the Marxist nature of these protests, you will be mocked and dismissed as one of those lame brains who calls everything Marxism. A recent topic that has been pervasive since basically forever is racism and anti-racism. When someone advocates anti-racism by way of literally stating the concept of anti-racism, they are oftentimes called a Marxist. And you've probably seen somewhere the platitude that anti-racism is not Marxist. There's two things happening in this situation. You have idiots actually calling this Marxist, then you have the numbskulls who purposefully misrepresent those who take issue with the amorphous nature of anti-racism, leading them to declare shit like 
anti-racism is not Marxist. And that's a topic for another time, so let me adjust my focus away from that slight tangent. While being anti-racist is not inherently Marxist, these protests are innately Marxist. And I'll demonstrate this in the video. I'll also demonstrate how someone who isn't a Marxist might go about talking about these issues that are supposedly at the center of these protests. I'll talk about Black Lives Matter, the overall ideology behind the parallel events such as the rioting and looting, and I'll also supplement this conversation with additional topics that I really think will bolster my argument. We must first identify what Marxism is. Marxism is simply the political and economic theories of Karl Marx and his associate Friedrich Engels or Engels. I know the title of this video is These Protests Are Innately Communist, but in reality it's more specific than that. Communism existed at least several hundred years before Karl Marx. The idea of a classless and egalitarian society is said to have emerged in ancient Greece and communist thought is said to be traceable back to Thomas More's 1516 utopia. Fast forward to 1848 with the revised interpretation of communist thought with the Communist Manifesto offered by Karl Marx and his associate. In short, it's possible to be a communist and not Marxist. It's possible to have some sort of understanding of communism that is inspired by Karl Marx. What makes Karl Marx's iteration of communism so pervasive is by the very tactics he uses in an attempt to bolster his politics. He offers a very revisionist and bizarre interpretation of society. In the first line of the first chapter of the Communist Manifesto, depending on the the release that you're reading after you get through all of the prefaces, a very bold claim is made. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles, meaning that all of history, up to the point of this declaration, is a history of class struggles. Making class struggle the sole principle by how you view politics undermines every single tribulation humanity has gone through at this point. He continues, Free man and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. In the earlier epics of history, we find almost everywhere in a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves. In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vessels, guildmasters, journeymen, apprentices, serfs, and in almost all of these classes, again, subordinate gradations. The modern bourgeoisie society that has sprouted from the ruins of few feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms, it has but established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. Owning a business, leading an organization, owning property, in the eyes of a Marxist, is equivalent to being a slave master, dictator, or essentially the most fundamental abstraction oppressor. Any hierarchical structure that you see is simply just oppressor versus oppressed. Your success is built by exploitation of subordinates, well essentially under you. According to Marx and his associate, the immediate aim of the communists is the overthrow of the bourgeoisie supremacy, conquest of political power by the proletariat. This line doubles down on the Marxist view that the world is defined by class struggles, thus divided by oppressor versus oppressed. It also makes it clear that their goal is to dismantle and replace what they perceive as the status quo. Very interestingly, Marx and his associate write, the distinguishing feature of communism is not the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeoisie property. 
which is an admission that their focus is not going to be property owners of who they perceive to be oppressed. It's going after the oppressors. Its end goal is certainly the abolition of private property, but until they supplant the powerful and wealthy, they won't move to abolition of the entire idea of private property. This is about giving the proletariat an advantage. It's important to highlight that Marx viewed property as the final and most complete expression of the system of producing and appropriating products that is based on class antagonisms, on the exploitation of the many by the few. Wealth, capital, and property is viewed by Marxists to be a social power. Marx himself also acknowledged that communism won't materialize instantly and that there will be certain practical measures that will be implemented by different countries based on circumstance. He listed 10 different measures one might see enacted. He lists 10 generalized measures and outcomes, but declares that again, it will vary by country. Number one, abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. A heavy progressive or graduated income tax, abolition of all rights of inheritance, confiscation of the property of all immigrants and rebels, centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly, centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, the bringing into cultivation of wastelands, and the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan. Basically, uh, they're talking about environmentalism. Equal liability of all to work. Establishment of industrial armies, especially for agriculture. Combin combination of agriculture with manufacturing and industries. Gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by a more equitable distribution of the populace over the country. Free education for all children in public schools, abolition of children's factory labor in its present form, combination of education with industrial production. In the Communist Manifesto, there is a list of demands from the Communist Party to Germany, and one of the interesting demands is the right of inheritance to be curtailed. So take note of that because that's important. So now at this point, let's pull abstracted principles from the Communist Manifesto. All of society up until now has been defined by class struggles. Society is divided by class, which can be interpreted as oppressor versus oppressed. And that's in Marx's own words. Private property is the exploitation of the many by the few. The overthrow of the oppressors, wealthy, powerful, is a net good. Many practical measures can be implemented to bring about communism, such as seizing property from the capitalists first, or the oppressors, nationalizing transportation and the arts, educating children, and teaching them about communism. And of course, a specific focus on environmentalism. Breaking down Marxism into platitudes is useful in order to get a generalized sense of what Marxism is all about. The main abstraction from Marxism is the idea of all of society being based on class warfare or oppressor versus the oppressed. Marxism sounds nice up until you start to accumulate wealth yourself and start experiencing a noticeable rise in your standard of living. You become less inclined to advocate policies that would directly impact you negatively. Appealing to someone by means of class struggle is weak on its own. However, there's still a major abstracted principle at play here. Max Horkheimer, Horkheimer, I'm not good with German names, of the Frankfurt School of Sociology in his 1937 essay, Traditional and Critical Theory, defined something called critical theory and described it as a social theory to be used for critiquing and changing society as a whole as opposed to the method 
methods employed by Marxism, which include understanding and explaining it. Max and his ilk believed that the rise of National Socialism, state capitalism, and culture industry were new forms of social domination that could not be adequately explained within the terms of traditional Marxist sociology. Critical theory is meant to liberate human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. Critical theory has two core concepts. A theory should be directed at the totality of society in its historical specificity. In other words, how it came to be configured at a specific point in time. And it should improve understanding of society by integrating all the major social sciences. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, because such theories aim to explain and transform all the circumstances that enslave human beings, many critical theories in the broader sense have been developed. They have emerged in connection with many social movements that identify varied dimensions of the domination of human beings in modern societies. Postmodern neo Marxist. Postmodern neo Marxist. Let's shift a little more. We have the first examples of Marxism being expanded and reinvented to be more encompassing in the form of the th of theory. But then there's postmodernism, a whole different beast. Postmodernism is interesting. I'm not a fan of it by any means. However, there's one intellectual thinker, teacher, and academic who is a postmodernist I really admire and have really learned a great deal from. His name is Thaddeus Russell. And this video won't be about postmodernism or at least the ilk of Thaddeus Russell because I, I find that there is Thaddeus Russell has a different interpretation of postmodernism and the problems he identifies with the things that he identifies he comes up with solutions vastly different than what I'm going to be talking about which is the sort of merger between postmodernism and critical theory known as postmodern critical theory. Thomas R. Lindelof, professor of journalism and media at the University of Kentucky State that postmodern critical theory politicizes social problems by situating them in historical and cultural contexts to implicate themselves in the process of collecting and analyzing data and to relativize their findings. Postmodernism as an ideology rejects grand narratives and ideologies associated with modernism and focuses on the role of ideology in maintaining political or economic power. One example of postmodernist tactics and theories being appropriated by critical theorists is the Socialist Review, formerly known as Socialist Revolution, which was a left-wing periodic established in San Francisco in 1970 as a Voice, according to them, for socialist discourse addressing issues of feminism, gender and sexuality, international affairs, social justice, political and economic systems, cultural theory, and postmodern critical theory. Oftentimes you'll hear what I'm laying out to be referred to as cultural Marxism, which is a term lampooned by the left and other left-wing sympathizers. Specifically, I've encountered this with left-wing libertarians. They'll call it a conspiracy theory, or they'll focus on how postmodernism criticizes Marxism, therefore it can't be Marxism. This is, of course, absurd, as you can see. I've clearly demonstrated the existence of critical theory and the marriage between critical theory and postmodernist thought. Relevant links will be in the description box below, so go ahead and check those out. Also, this idea that a successor, a successor which is birthed from a specific ideology can't criticize thinkers of an ideology that they were influenced by, to me, is absolutely absurd. I would say that cultural Marxism probably isn't the best term to describe this. You even get laughed at if you call it postmodern critical theory to an extent, and if you go the Jordan Peterson route and call it postmodern neo-Marxism, uh, you also might seem like a conspiracy theorist because right now nobody calls themselves any of these terms. Nobody says, hey, I'm a cultural Marxist. Nobody says, I am a uh, postmodern critical theorist. Nobody says, I am a postmodern neo-Marxist. That's very rare, and you'll probably hear somebody call themselves a postmodernist, more so than somebody would apply critical theorists to themselves. 
with that being said, just because somebody doesn't call themselves that, it doesn't mean that the ideology hasn't influenced a particular way of thinking. In Ayn Rand's book, Objectivism, no, uh, Philosophy, Who Needs It, sorry, she goes over some common phrases that are used by people today and explains their philosophical beginnings. So people are influenced by philosophy whether or not they can name their way of thinking to a specific philosopher. So just keep that in mind and let's continue on with this video. Let's move on to Black Lives Matter. Do you think Black Lives Matter? Have you heard that question before? The proponents of Black Lives Matter are either deceptive or ignorant of the causes they support. They will pretend like Black Lives Matter is just a phrase. Many will pretend it is just about police brutality. Don Lemon, anybody? Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement was started because it was talking about police brutality. If you want an all Black Lives Matter movement that talks about gun violence in communities, including, you know, black communities, then start that movement with that name. But that's not what Black Lives Matter is about. It's not an all encompassing. So if you're talking about um, if, if someone started a movement that said uh, cancer matters and then someone comes in and says, I can't think of a more genius rhetorical phrase. Black Lives Matter perfectly encapsulates taking the concept of oppressor versus oppressed as identified by Marx as being the root of modern society and applying it to social issues. Black Lives Matter, however, it's not just a phrase despite its, you know, rhetorical genius. And the phrase, well, like I said, it's rhetorical genius because it's too amorphous to just be about police brutality about it's not an all encompassing and this is by design black lives matter is self-admittedly a global network which builds power to bring justice healing and freedom to black people across the globe fair enough nothing about that sounds sinister i would agree with that but it's clear that black lives matter is an organization even if you agree with its message the only refute against my assertion that black lives matter is is an organization by declaring it as a decentralized network. The first thing to know is that a decentralized network or something that is decentralized doesn't imply the absence of a central authority. Any subsidiary that is granted some degree of autonomy is by definition decentralized. The United States is a great example of this historically. Before the Constitution existed, the Articles of Confederation was the governing document. It focused heavily on decentralization, the states holding the majority of the executive and legislative powers. The central government had very little power. James Madison and the other Federalists supported a much stronger central government. The result as a compromise between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists was the United States Constitution which still implemented a form of decentralization. The states were still sub-sovereign and for the most part retained control over their own jurisdictions. Decentralization is a generalized concept and is not necessarily an extreme. Even if you're not convinced of my argument that a decentralized organization can still have a centralized control, let's look at how the central Black Lives Matter page describes their goal. So BLM's What Matters 2020 is a campaign aimed to maximize the impact of the BLM movement by galvanizing BLM supporters and allies to the polls in the 2020 US presidential election to build collective power and ensure candidates are held accountable for the issues that systematically and disproportionately impact black and underserved communities across the nation. The Black Lives Matter website has a tendency to refer to itself as a single movement rather than a series of movements or campaigns of grassroots organizations. In the about section 
Black Lives Matter refers to itself as a single founded organization which attempts to build local power. The BLM website is not describing itself as a conglomeration of smaller movements that united under a single cause. It is a centralized organization. And the reason why it is important to determine whether or not Black Lives Matter is a single singular organization, whether it was built from the outside to the center or from one organization and outwards, is to dismantle any idea or rebuttal that the organization is a group made up of many individuals, therefore BLM is just a simple phrase. Black Lives Matter has its own concrete conceptual meaning just like any other word or organization. It's not an all-encompassing so, so let's ask ourselves one fundamental question that is crucial to this entire discussion. Is Black Lives Matter about police brutality? About. It's not an all-encompassing. According to the About page, the answer is no. The only thing you can say for certain is two things. The first thing you can claim is that its initial founding was inspired by police brutality and that BLM does talk about police brutality. However, the BLM website and movement is far more encompassing. What does this mean exactly? Someone who tries to convince you that BLM is about police brutality is gaslighting you. About. It's not an all-encompassing. Or they fundamentally do not understand the cause that they purport to advocate. The phrase Black Lives Matter is far too amorphous and the website makes it crystal clear that BLM is an all-encompassing movement. From my perspective, the all-encompassing nature of the organization is an insult to black people. On the BLM page, there is a section about the What Matters 2020 campaign, which contains the excerpt I read earlier about BLM's goal of influencing the presidential election. According to this section, BLM's hashtag What Matters 2020 campaign will focus on issues concerning racial injustice, police brutality, criminal justice reform, black immigration, economic justice, LGBTQIA+, and human rights, environmental injustice, access to healthcare, access to quality education, and voting rights and suppression. In another section, the website repeats all of the previously mentioned focused areas with an additional focus, common sense gun laws. If I granted the benefit of the doubt with things like racial injustice, police brutality, criminal justice reform, voting rights and suppression, education and government corruption, it's hard for me not to see black immigration, LGBT plus healthcare, environmental conditions, and common sense gun laws as anything other than a left wing standard democratic platform. But more on that later. So returning to the about section of the BLM webpage, I can't help but notice a section that reads we affirm the lives of black, queer, and trans folks, disabled folks, undocumented folks, folks with records, women, and all black lives along the gender spectrum. About. It's not an all-encompassing. In the What We Believe section of the page, emphasis is put on connecting black people from all over the world who have a shared desire for justice to act together in their communities. And I take an issue with this because as if all black people everywhere were slaves. How these guys think that they it's like they they think they inherit it's, the it's, 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 white, it's, it's white supremacy. I mean, you want to be it's, 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 it's luckily white supremacy. <laughs> it's, 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 it's luckily white supremacy. If you want to be completely honest with it, that's the perfect way to assess it. Is <laughs> if, if left wing white white supremacists because they think that they can they talk down to you. They talk down. They literally talk down to you like, hey, black man, as, as me as the white guy. The, the progressive white guy, I know more about what, what it is that, that, that you think you know about. And this is the position that you should have as a black person because it'll benefit you and your community. Granted, these guys have lived nowhere near me. Uh, they don't have anything near the experience that I have or anything like that, but they think that they get to make that claim because, again, they think that they, they inherit the moral high ground. They think they just have it. One of the funniest arguments I ever got in online was someone who was trying to convince me that I was oppressed. And it was the funny. It was the funny. I can't remember even how it started, oh but I, I I said something that must have like sounded like remotely conservative or something. Mm -hmm. And they said, um, so first of all, the first error they made was uh, they said something about um, they they assumed I was a black American, uh, right? So yeah. they they said something about me about my ancestors being slaves and like they went on this huge tirade. And I was like, my ancestors weren't slaves. 
fuck. <laughs> like, 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 first, like, like, firstly, like, like I, I, I'm not. They can't even wrap their mind around that there's different <laughs> black people, bro. They can't even, black like, people have different experiences. Like, yes, there's, there's like first generation Af- Africans that, that exist. Even in America, they assume, yeah. they just assume like, yeah, man, you should know history. Like, he's like, dude, my, my parents were never slaves anywhere. Like, what? Yeah. Or my ancestors were never slaves at any point in time uh, because they came from like, you know, uh, Africa. It's like, what the, what in the world is going on? But I, I can't imagine the crap that you get because I think they assume because you definitely have, you have a more American Accent. The BLM website states that they do the work required to dismantle cisgendered privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women. They build a space that affirms black women and is free from sexism, misogyny, and environments in which men are centered. About It's not an all-encompassing. From my perspective, this seems to be entirely different from police brutality, which disproportionately affects men. They dis- dismantle the patriarchal practice that requires mothers to work double shifts so that they can mother in private even as they participate in public justice work which is odd i don't even know what that means oh here's a good one we disrupt the western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another especially our children to the degree that mothers parents and children are comfortable the concept of a nuclear family has never been about prohibiting extended families and community what i find interesting is the emphasis on western prescribed obviously this means western society so what is a nuclear family well a nuclear Nuclear family is just a couple and their dependent children is a basic unit. So this does not imply that grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, neighbors are to be non-existent or negative. But when you describe it as Western prescribed, you really mean to say monogamous marriages or the couple as kids. In the eyes of the racially focused left, oftentimes they use Western society or civilization interchangeably with white society. It's important to note this because this is how they view that concept. If you say something about Western civilization or Western society preserving those values, they will accuse you of supporting white supremacy. They will think and accuse you of using that term to mean white people, a society built on the exploitation of minorities. And also one of the reasons why they put this on their website is because one of the ills of the black community as identified from a western view or supposed white view is the single mother rate and promiscuity more common in the black community we foster a queer affirming network when we gather we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual unless she he or they disclose otherwise and i'll save my deeper criticisms for last but i will say this the person who coded this website and authored the page's contents was created via a heterosexual relationship therefore it's kind of a thing that we do considering statistics about the amount of heterosexuals in society and the fact that every single living person was created through a heterosexual Sexual, sexual act is why somebody would assume that almost everybody they come across is a heterosexual about it's not an all-encompassing and don't worry all of this will be integrated quite nicely well considering where does marxism fit in with all of this Everything I listed above will be integrated to make my point about these modern protests we are seeing being innately communist. That's a point that I stand by and will defend and it'll all make sense. Let's take one more look on the BLM page for new information which is going to help integrate. It's going to be the segue. The Black Lives Matter page has three co-founders listed. Um, I might slaughter these names. I apologize. Uh, Patrice, Patrice, Con Colors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi are the three listed. Patrice, or Patrice, I don't know how that's pronounced, my apologies, is the most interesting of the three. The other two, Alicia and Opal, are only listed as co-founder, however they do play a much 
bigger role. But because of this interesting note, we're going to focus on uh, Patrish. Patrish? Well, I'll call her I'll call her Pat. So she's listed as co-founder and strategic advisor. So let's set the stage. Once upon a time, there was a radical left, a militant organization known as the Weather Underground. This organization was active in the late 1960s and 1970s. The group was calling for a white fighting force to be allied with the Black Liberation Movement, and their goal was to achieve the destruction of US imperialism and form a classless communist world. They rioted, broke windows of banks, cars, stores, exploded Molotov cocktails in front of the home of a Supreme Court justice, threw Molotov cocktails at Columbia University, and made several bombs because they were planning to kill army soldiers and non-commissioned officers, as well as random people at Columbia University, and were only caught making them because the idiots accidentally detonated one of them. Part of this group was Eric Mann, who was wanted on four accounts and arrested for a conspiracy to commit murder, assault with intent to commit murder, promotion of anarchy, and threatening. And he had a protege named Patrish Khan Kohlers. So this all comes full circle. We have just identified the first example of Black Lives Matter being linked with Marxism, but maybe she doesn't believe in Marxism. Maybe she just was influenced by this intellectual who just so happened to be part of a militant left-wing group. Well, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. And I think that what we really try to do is build a movement that could be utilized by many, many black folk. Um, we don't necessarily want to be the vanguard um, of this movement. She describes how she became a trained organizer with the Labor Community Strategy Center, a center which describes this philosophy as an urban experiment using grassroots organization to focus on black and Latino communities with deep historical ties to the long history of anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, pro-communist resistance to the United States empire. So far, we have confirmation that at least two out of three Black Lives Matter co-founders are very much Marxist with one of them having direct ties to someone who was a member of a radical left-wing terrorist group. So what about the third one? Well, Opal supported Venezuelan socialist dictator President Maduro, even sharing a stage. If you've made it this far in the video, congratulations! You have arrived at the point in this video where everything is integrated together. The culmination of the backstory of critical theory, a brief description of postmodernism, and a dive into the page of Black Lives Matter. About It's not an all-encompassing Marxism as an ideology has evolved beyond its inception as a description of society being defined by class struggles. The concept of class struggles can be further delineated and basically abstracted into oppressor versus oppressed, which Marx heavily mentions in the Communist Manifesto. Of course, if you're a Marxist and you witness the supposed proletariat becoming complacent and your prediction of a revolution doesn't happen, you have to re-examine your ideology. But why abandon it when you can evolve it into something else, something different? You really start to focus on the concept of oppressor versus oppressed, and you begin to apply it to situations that are not related to economics. You apply it to race, gender, nationality, age, geography, and any other sub-delineation that you can think of. You realize that postmodernism offers you a much more flexible lens by which to view the world in. The dominant narratives of society and a modern hierarchical structure becomes a tool for you to deconstruct and present as an example of the oppression dichotomy. What if gender is a social construct and is a means by which the hetero cisgendered people oppress the trans community? Marriage is innately a patriarchal power struggle between 
between man and woman. Congratulations. It's no coincidence that the largest advocacy group for social issues tends to favor socialistic policies or government control over issues that they purport to care about. The Socialist Review, a California-based periodical dedicated to talking about socialism, feminism, racism, and so on, the Black Lives Matter co-founders all being associated with some form of socialist ideology, power struggles and the oppression dichotomy being presented in every instance of social justice, the language on the BLM page centered around being inclusive to the LGBT plus community is based on the idea that homophobia and transphobia are pervasive in Western civilization. Western society is oppressive to transsexuals and homosexuals according to this ideology. The message behind Black Lives Matter is that white people are the oppressors and black people are the oppressed. Let's look at this article from American Friends Service Committee titled Note to Self, White People Taking Part in Hashtag Black Lives Matter Protests. A white gender queer lesbian with the pronoun Z wrote in the first paragraph, I am a white person who recently participated in a Black Lives Matter protest. As a queer gender queer person, I know about some forms of oppression, but I didn't want my own unconscious racism, entitlement, and unexamined privilege to perpetuate the pathology and systems we were there to protest. So not only do white people oppress black people, but they don't even know they do it, which makes this ideology much more stronger because it doesn't matter if you don't actively support white supremacy. And this is a clear demonstration of a race divide and an attempt at describing black history as a racial struggle. If there isn't an issue, you manufacture one. An article was published in The Atlantic by an author who wrote a book titled White Too Long, The Legacy of White. The article argues that white Christian America needs a moral awakening. The author describes how when he was going to church, no one ever talked about the white supremacist roots of his faith, and he declares that talking about it will allow white Christians to build a better future for themselves and everybody else around them. In other words, the author describes a town and a church inhabited by mostly white people who are minding their own business by going to work, going to church, and going home. By not focusing on race, they are somehow going to do a disservice to black folk and the fight against white supremacy. It's inconceivable for someone with this mindset to accept that race doesn't play a role in these people's lives, especially as it relates to the history of white supremacy. Kind of like how Marx declared that the history of society is based on class struggle, this article in Vox essentially argues that America and its capitalist system is based on racism. Let's not forget about the number one New York Times bestseller, White Fragility, by Robin DiAngelo, a professor at the University of Washington, and in the book, she literally declares that any societal structure that results in any racial inequality is racist, and much, much more. Basically, everything white people have is because they have systematically repressed black America from reaching their full potential. The mention of income inequality on the BLM page isn't going to end with the advocacy of free markets. Black Lives Matter activists oppose privatization of anything and advocate for a revamped tax code that'll redistribute wealth. BLM supports raising the corporate income tax, raising taxes on the highest wealth earners. The nuclear family is an oppressive Western structure, aka white civilization. Why was environmentalism mentioned in the BLM page? I already know someone somewhere is going to comment about how global warming hurts poor people. The reality is environmentalism hurts poor people. It just so happens that environmentalism is a backdoor to nationalizing every single industry imaginable. Nationalization is at the root of communism, which is why environmentalism is the number one alarmist cause for the left. Every industry requires the use of energy. What better way to have direct control over the economy than the input and output of energy? So let's talk about gun control. Is it any coincidence that both the Black Lives Matter movement and the left support gun control? Gun control is really just gonna make single mothers vulnerable in primary neighborhoods. Gun control will also just create another excuse for cops to interact with black people more aggressively. How exactly are you going to enforce gun control when defunding the police? When trying to decrease police interaction? Gun control is 
a policy that literally requires the use of force to confiscate weapons from people you deem to not need them and to enforce those laws. Ultimately, this all culminates in police brutality. But let's continue. Um, so let's talk about the access to health care. Sure, this is ambiguous, but be honest, considering everything else, do you really think they're talking about privatizing the healthcare industry? They're not. There's proof. The Black Lives Matter movement supports universal health care. There's not a single socialist crying in horror at the prospects of universal health care, even if it's from a Democrat who's not necessarily a communist. And there's not a single socialist crying. Economic injustice is going to come up with its own slew of regulations as well as the aforementioned tax hikes and wealth redistribution. The only thing missing is the confiscation of private property from white people, which you could probably find specific individuals associated with the Black Lives Matter community that would think that's a solid idea. If Black Lives Matter was a movement grounded in free markets, Government power would be called into question rather than the ambiguous mention of government corruption. The Constitution would be mentioned, property rights would be at the center of the organization, the war on drugs would have its own section on the BLM page, deregulation of free markets would be offered as a solution as well as messages about community and volunteerism bringing cultures together without the mention of Western society and their prescribed idea of a nuclear family, which is a direct response, as I stated earlier, to the fact that the majority of mothers in the black community are single. But that's not what we get. We don't get any of that. Instead, we get a movement filled with racial divide, gender divide, class struggles, mentions of patriarchy, gun control, income inequality, health care, so on and so forth. The element of Marxism goes beyond just Black Lives Matter. Destroying private property and industry sends a message loud and clear. The products of capitalism directly contribute to black oppression. A cop kills a black man wrongfully, and the direct response is to loot Walmart and J.C. Penney. Walmart didn't hire the cop to put his knee on the back of a man's neck. However, if you have a left-wing postmodern critical theorist view, you view capitalism as a structure that perpetuates racism. 16 scholars are helping to set the record straight by exploring the true ties between 19th century economic development and a brutal system of human bondage in the 2016 book Slavery's Capitalism, A New History of American Economic Development. This is beyond police brutality. This isn't just about what black people go through. This is also about tearing down the pillars of whatever is left of free enterprise classical liberalism, property rights, and basic social structures that make human flourishing possible. It's doubling down on the postmodern social constructionist theory that declares there is no such thing as biological sex. Looting and rioting is a rejection of property rights. It's one group using a horrific event as an excuse to violate your rights. If you're better off because you've built something massive, you are part of the power hierarchy that exploits the downtrodden. This brings me to another topic, the act of blocking traffic. There's nothing peaceful about impeding on someone's right to travel on a road they have legal access to using a vehicle that belongs to them. If you block a road, you are not peaceful. Peaceful is defined as free from disturbance, tranquil, and not involving war, or violence. If you inhibit someone's ability to travel a road they have permission to use for their personal purpose, you are disturbing their normal arrangement and function of the road, their right to use the road unencumbered, and use of their vehicle. If they attempt to pass by you and this results in you surrounding their car, hitting their car, and breaking their windows, you have initiated violence against them. Therefore, you have rendered yourself unpeaceful by every single definition of the concept of peace. Marxism implies that the proletariat is morally right 
due to their status as an oppressed class, meaning they would be right to overthrow the capitalist structure. This concept is important to understand so you are able to get an idea of the mindset behind the protesters blocking traffic as well as the looters and rioters. If you are morally superior because you are oppressed or you are morally superior for being an ally to the oppressed, then you are morally justified to stand up against the oppressors even if it means retarding travel. Blocking traffic is by definition antithetical to being peaceful. I hope that I have been able to accentuate what it is exactly that structures current left wing ideology. It's not an accident that the modern day left has usurped every major social issue legitimate and otherwise. Powerful ideas, even if wrong, become pervasive even if the social engineers become forgotten. I hope I have been able to accentuate the very nature of these protests with an emphasis on Black Lives Matter. It's okay to be dubious about the current protests and it's okay to view Black Lives Matter as an organization that has dubious ethics and goals.